Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very exciting fireside chat. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I'm the campaigns director for In Defense of Animals. And we are here today to celebrate the American Wetlands Appreciation Month. And we're going to do that by featuring our advocacy to protect Biona wetlands. So we're very thrilled today to have everybody here and also to have our special guest, who is Marsha Hanscom. She's with us today and she is going to be my cohort in sharing more about the Biona wetlands and all of our advocacy there. Hi, Marsha. Hi, thank you, Lisa, for having me and for your great partnership in this important work. Um, and thank you to everybody for joining us today. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so I also want to take a moment here while we are starting to uh, welcome everyone here and also introduce people to, we have a couple people from IDA here. We've got uh, our development director, Bob Price. So he Hello. is here and just wanted to make sure everybody knows that you are here. And we also have Mary who's here, um, Mary Eastensee. And she, what she will be doing is helping in the chat box. So you may see messages from Bob or from Mary and they will be conversing with you. So we really appreciate their help. And thank you so much, Bob. Glad to be here. Thank you for your time. So as I mentioned, today is Piona Wetlands Day for us. We are going to be going through and explaining more about this precious resource, which is in the Los Angeles area. For some of you who don't know that, it is one of the few remaining wetlands on the California coast, and we are trying to protect it. So Marsha and I and many other uh, advocates, some of them here with us today, have been working diligent on, diligently on this. So I'd like to, if it's all right with you, we'll start today with a little presentation. So we'll have some slides, and then from there, we will have a QA. and a We'd love to hear from you. And today, we also have something special going on that we'll tell you more about later, but there's opportunities to win a, a IDA t-shirt that has the Biona Wetlands logo on it, Biona Wetlands, and one of the, I think it features an owl, one of the burrowing owls. It's a really lovely t-shirt, and that could be yours. <laughs> so we'll be selecting, randomly selecting um, three uh, of the participants today, and then you will get a message from uh, Bob, our development director, or from Mary, who assists him uh, with this, if you're one of the people who was selected. So we're very grateful to you for tuning in, and that's one way that we're showing it to you. So I think we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, slideshow. So give me a moment here to push the buttons and make sure I've got all of that set up properly. Back to button pushing. <laughs> Here we go. Great. Wonderful. So I'm going to get us to the right slide to start. And now I am going to put it into slideshow mode and then we'll get this in gear for everyone. Um, so uh, first of all, thanks to everybody Again, for joining, this is our Biona Wetlands Fireside Chat. And we have myself, Lisa Levinson, the Campaigns Director, and Marsha Hanscom, who is with Defend Biona Wetlands and the Coastal Lands Action Network. So today, we are going to share with you a little bit about as, uh, con how Congress declared May as American Wetlands Month but also we're gonna get into the nitty gritty today about what is going on at Biona with the truth. We're gonna expose some of the truth to you, uh, get into who owns the land, 
we will explain some of the lawsuits that were filed and some that are uh, in process and explain also a bit about the sea level risks and why this rise in sea level would be dangerous to people and to animals. We'll also go over some of the science that is being ignored right now by, by the agencies who want to push this uh, restoration project forward. So the last piece is that we will have opportunities for you to act. We actually have a very new uh, alert, which is our style of petition that you can sign. And we would love it if everyone here could sign that alert because it will go to officials directly and let them know uh, our stance on what's happening at Biona Wetlands right now. So I thought we'll get a little bit into um, what, who owns the land and the state agency. So I'm going to invite Marsha, if you don't mind, I uh, will have you share a little bit about this, about this now. So I'm going to pin you to do this. And then you'll have access to moving the slides if you like, or actually let me know since I haven't been shared. So let me know when you'd like them to be moved. Yeah, so this land, um, you know, first of all, we're on unceded territory of numerous indigenous people and their tribal nations, some of many of which are still here. It's not something in the past, although it used to be acknowledged that this was their land. Um, there there are still people here who who call this land sacred and believe it is their land and I believe that too. It's it's land that belongs to all of us, belongs to the earth. And um, that's the Shoshone Gabrielino Nation, the Tongva Nation, uh, the Keech Nation, a number of Tongva tribes. So, um, but, you know, in our European system that has been here uh, in 2003, there were, there were, this land was privately owned by a number of corporations. And because of public outcry for how important this land is, the state of California acquired 640 acres that are now owned officially by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and the California State Lands Commission. Uh, next slide. Uh, so it was the land was acquired for the public benefit and for protection of animals like this American kestrel you see here. Um, one of the beautiful raptor species that we have at Biona, we have a number of raptors that are supposed to be protected by the state of California, particularly since the land was designated, much of this 640 acres in 2005 was designated as a state ecological reserve. And after that happened, the the land was the landowners, State Lands Commission and Fish and Wildlife were actually really absentee landowners for a number of years because the state was broke. And during that time, some private interests got together with the Coastal Conservancy, where there was a lot of bond money, and put together a plan that would really decimate the area, which is not what an ecological reserve is supposed to be and not what this land was protected for originally. So in 2017, there was a draft environmental impact report that uh, in, in defense of animal supporters and a number of other organizations uh, submitted comments on and we all said this would harm the wildlife and it would really favor a, an antiquated gas methane gas storage facility that operates throughout the wetlands. And therefore, by 2020, we there were four different lawsuits that were filed um, against a final environmental impact report that was released. Next slide, please. And what was interesting was between 2017 and the time a final EIR, Environmental Impact Report, was approved, 
the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers pulled out of the whole situation. It had been a federally and state sanctioned project that was moving forward. But the Army Corps of Engineers said, wait a minute, you're not even using the correct flood risk standards, state of California and all your consultants that you're paying millions of dollars for. And so they said, you know, we don't, we're not so sure we should remove the levees that protect the people and protect the habitat. And many of these animals and plants are not adapted for this high salinity salt water that would be coming in. But the Army Corps and the U and the uh, the Federal uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, they both pulled out and said we are not supportive of this project. And so, next slide. That sort of came into the calculation of when the judge, uh, what the judge had to say. So these, there were seven different lawsuits that have been filed. I think there's more than 10 now that have been filed over various things. But the four that were filed over the environmental impact report had a victory last year. Last year at this time we were in court, I think it was either May or June. And uh, by the end of the summer, we had a very strong a uh, final judgment that basically said nothing can be done out there on this site. The judge didn't say, well, fix this in the environmental impact report and fix that. Instead, he said Not the, the full environmental impact report is null and void. I'm going to tell you we're throwing it out and it's time for the Fish and Wildlife Service to, or the US, or the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, sorry, we've got all these agencies, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife to decide whether they're gonna move forward or not. And um, so, because the EIR must be decertified, that means there's no environmental clearance to do the work that's described in this project. Next slide, please. Well, unfortunately, the California Department of Fish and Wildlife decided to move forward anyway. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna put out a new uh, environmental review and we're gonna do it by ourselves. We don't need the federal government, which they're wrong about, but that's what they decided. And um, even though the, the most, everyone except for one person who attended the scoping meeting in December on go moving forward, everyone was opposed to the project moving forward this way. Yet the Fish and Wildlife Department decided to move forward and they're allowing work to be done. You can see these photographs were taken just last week. They are allowing work to be done by the fossil fuel industry, by SoCal Gas, Pacific Petroleum, uh, to do some of the same things that they said they wanted to do as part of this, quote, restoration project. They want to move these wells all over the, the site. They want to do some slant drilling. And basically, they want to upgrade their facility and make it so that and expand the facility so that it can continue into the future. And if you know much about methane gas, you, and have paid attention to the science the last couple of years, scientists are now saying that methane gas is one of the worst contributors toward climate change. And so we really should be shutting down this gas facility that is throughout the wetlands and instead, um, you know, looking at focusing on more genuine renewable energy but the fossil fuel in industry doesn't want to do that. So here they are working away. Numerous state agencies have approved them being out there. And we just had a letter our lawyer sent last week to all the regulators and the governor saying, you've got to stop this. This is in defiance of the court order. Next slide, please. So, Maybe Lisa, you want to talk about in defense of animals and what you've how you've been supportive and working with us. Yes, I will do that. Thank you so much. I'm going to add my um, 
add the pen, I think, here. <laughs> uh, so thank you, Marcia, for explaining all of the details. It can be a little confusing, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to um, host this special fireside chat to clarify mm -hmm. what's going on there behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So we do have, um, uh, let me go ahead and make it a little, a little smaller for everybody. Uh, So what we have is in 2017, we joined the scene here in defense of animal supporters. We put together an alert and we uh, encouraged all of our supporters and many of you probably commented on the draft EIR. And this was very significant because it got the US Army Corps of Engineers involved. We were able to reach them and get a response from them, which is pretty rare. <laughs> and then in 2020, we in Defense of Animals became a founding member of Defend Biona Wetlands, which is a coalition of organizations that are environmental and also animal based that's in the local area around the Biona Wetlands. And then we also have in 2021, when the this was a big deal because the final EIR was released. And in 2022, we helped to put together a fundraiser to raise funds for the legal fees to, uh, to engage in this battle that was happening at the, at the legal, in the legal court system there. And so thanks to some of you may have attended the fundraiser. We did this in cooperation with, uh, Jane Unchained, and we hosted a wonderful event in the Southern California area, and we even had some celebrities who joined us, and that's where we launched that Biona Wetlands t-shirt. We were able to, our president, um, Dr. Marilyn Crockett, was able to give this uh, t-shirt to one of the celebrities there, and um, from then on, it became a hot, hot topic. <laughs> so after that, we were able to um, report this wonderful court victory in 2023. Some of you may remember getting a blog, a victory blog from us about this court victory. And then 2024, coming right up to today, we now have a new alert, which is to stop the bulldozing of Biona wetlands and to support the 20 point gentle alternative, which does not involve heavy machinery. And this alert is important because it talks about how the, the California, our state here in California, is uh, defying the court order by doing these workarounds and um, giving permits when this was contested legally. So what have we been doing for that? We actually, throughout this time, between 2017 and 2024, we've hosted town halls. So we hosted some online events to get the whole community, get everybody involved. We had scientific experts who were part of this and we brought this, raised awareness about this issue. Then we also have done several alerts and many of you have signed them. Uh, anytime there was any activity by SoCal Gas on the property, on the land, we did one of our alerts. Um, anything going on behind the scenes there, we tried to raise awareness to expose it. And we also did media releases. So in cooperation with Marsha and Defend Biona Wetlands, we produced uh, media releases to get the word out. We participated in the fundraiser, as I just mentioned, and of course the t-shirt, which a few of you will be um, getting as a special gift from us today. So if you're wondering what you can do to help, there is something. <laughs> At this very moment, you can sign our alert. And this is the alert that um, says, that California defies the court order and destroys part of the wetlands. So this was documented, as Marcia said, photographs even up until last week were taken showing that some of the animals in the image right here were um, are threatened by this gas activity that's going on, this construction. And so if you please, we really hope, especially for this, um, American Wetlands Appreciation Month, it's the perfect time to sign our alert so we could have more 
individual letters going directly to decision makers to let them know that we are opposed to these actions of defying the court order and destroying the vital habitat for 1,700 species of plants and animals that call Biona home. And please support the 20 point gentle alternative. If you look at the alert, which I believe is being posted in the chat box now, then you can also find a link to the, the 20 point uh, gentle alternative, which you can review. And that way you'll have more information about that too. So I want to take a look. Lisa, yeah. I'm just wondering if we could, if I could add that at last vi view this afternoon, I noticed more than 11,000 letters have been generated by this site. Um, and that's really important because the governor is getting a copy of this letter. This, the supervisor for oil and gas for the state of California is getting a copy of the letter. The head of the Coastal Commission and the Deputy Director of the Water Board, they're all receiving copies of your letter. So please do not just sign it, but share it with others. And because the more they see, the more they will understand there is a huge opposition to this project. And especially opposition to defying the court order. We may have to go back into court to get to get some relief from this, but maybe one of these officials will take some action in the meantime. Thank you so much, Marcia, for reiterating the importance of signing the alert. And I also wanna take a moment and just thank you for joining us for this is the, the end of our slide presentation, part of this um, fireside chat. And if you are able, we would love it if you could support our work. There's the, the vanity URL, you can go to our website and donate there um, on behalf of In Defense of Animals. So I think at this point, we'll stop the share and I'd like to open it up for some questions. So if there's anyone here who with us who has some questions, um, we may have either Bob or Mary who can assist with some of the, the questions that are there. And we will also uh, go ahead and review the chat. So we've got um, a question about other people from other countries being able to sign from outside the alert, outside the US. Yes, everyone can sign this alert. This is what we call an international uh, alert that we sent out via our e-news, which is our weekly newsletter. If you haven't signed up for that, you may wanna do that. We have a wonderful link to sign up for that. That way you can stay on, on top of all of our uh, many campaign initiatives. But for this, anyone can sign it because people do have a vested interest in, from all over the world in California. Many people visit California. Many people see the wetlands. Uh, and this is a habitat that is um, has benefits for people locally, but also uh, for visitors. And one of the reasons why other countries are important with this is we're right in the middle of the Pacific Flyway. And what that means is there are birds that come to the Biona Wetlands, that come through the Biona Wetlands from Canada, from the Arctic Circle, from Mexico, Guatemala, South America. And some of them come here actually to nest, like we have the the least turn, the endangered California least turn comes all the way from Guatemala and Mexico every year at this time, they're nesting on Venice beach and the, on the sand dune there. And then they come over to the wetlands and feed. And so we're in, we're, we're like sort of, sort of a rest stop on this flyway. Some of, some of them are coming here to stay for the summer. Some come for the winter and some come at, sort of as a, a rest stop on their way somewhere else. So Biona is really important internationally as well as nationally and in California. And I think that's why Congress decided to declare a special month to be American Wetlands Month. They realize how important places like this are. And in California, we've destroyed more than 91% of our wetlands. 
that was as of 30 years ago. We know more has been destroyed since. And so we just have to take every precious square inch of this place and and surround it with our love and our care and not let any, not let bulldozers, not let, this is not a good place for a fossil fuel industry operation. And besides the gas that they bring in and and inject into the ground beneath the wetlands and store it for use later, we also have a hundred barrels a day of of crude oil that they take out of the ground. So this is just an operation that needs to be closed down so that we can really uh, focus on protecting the wildlife. I'm wondering, Marcia, if you might also share a bit about some of the dangers, because there is another um, a real catastrophe that happened at Aliso Canyon, which is not too far away. And maybe what are the differences here? Well, the yeah, Aliso Canyon, some of you may have heard, is one of the largest explosions and hazards of fossil fuel and gas um, being dissipated into the atmosphere that the country has had. And uh, there were people that are still very sick. Pe people's animals, their pets were sick, and many of them passed away as a result of the problems from that big explosion. This is a very similar kind of gas storage facility. The gas is brought here through pipelines after it's fracked in Oklahoma and Texas, Colorado. It's brought here and, and injected into the ground about a mile beneath the surface under very high pressure. According to the county public, uh, county public health department, more than 200 chemicals are used. Chemicals like formaldehyde um, are used to inject and extract the gas. And so it's dangerous from a health perspective. If it's dangerous for humans nearby, you can imagine what about all these little animals that are there? And nobody's really even studying that. So we, we just know it's not safe. And we also know because there was a report put together um, by a, a scientific operation that the state legislature relies on. That report was said that this was the most dangerous gas storage facility in the state. And it's because there are homes and schools and places of worship all around this area. And, you know, the city of LA, the city of Culver City, the city of Santa Monica, and the County Board of Supervisors have all called on the governor to prioritize closing down this facility. And instead, we've got, you saw the trucks and the, the gas rigs. We've got the SoCal Gas actually doing work out there to modernize and make and expand their operation. And that's, we do not need that. Especially when they're decommissioning other wells in the state. And here we've got a perfect opportunity to do that. Exactly. And, you know, the secretary of the California EPA just last month said, made a big statement about the new science about methane gas, that methane is now understood to be a pollutant that is 25 times more potent than CO2, which is one of the things we've been concerned about for climate change. So, you know, we really just need to wean ourselves off of methane gas. And the fact that this, the fossil fuel industry seems committed to this place, um, it's just terrible. It makes no sense when we've got a, a reserve that is supposed to be protected. Well, there are a couple of questions. So I'm going to share them with you. One of them is, um, is going back to court the only option for stopping to work on this project? Is there no oversight um, or an, any kind of enforcement agency over the California Fish and Wildlife that can act? Absolutely. That's exactly why this alert is so important. They all report to the governor, first of all. Governor Gavin Newsom, who calls himself an environmentalist, we all think that he is by his reputation. So let's 
hold him accountable for that. We need to, this letters that you can, a letter that's already written, you can put your own information into it, but it's already written so he can see that there are this many, more than 11,000 people right now have written to him. Add your name, make sure your family and friends all have their names on these letters too. And make sure he understands that we know the Fish and Wildlife Department reports to him. And it's time for him to tell them to take a different tack down here. You know, get ever get all the stakeholders together and ask all of us who care about this place what we would like to see there. I can tell you that we don't want to see more gas rigs and we don't want to see bulldozers. And we do want to see a more gentle plan, which defendbionawetlands.org has a 20-point gentle alternative. So there's the governor, there's the oil and gas supervisor, there's the coastal commission director, there's the water board deputy director. Any one of them could shut this down and say, wait a minute, let's stop here. So, um, you know, but it takes courage. Uh, a lot of these people in government, they get our they get their courage from us because we're the ones that they really work for. And we just have to raise our voices together. And we're hopeful. And, and I can tell you, I want to tell you an example of how this does work. In Defense of Animals in December, maybe they posted it in November, but there was going to be a, a hearing in December at the Wildlife Conservation Board. And the Fish and Wildlife Department was going back after they had had the court say this project was no good anymore. They were going to the Wildlife Conservation Board to get millions of dollars to do some more work on planning the project to fix, to so-called fix the flood risk problems. And they had already gotten that same amount of money from another, from another agency. They'd already gotten money from the Coastal Conservancy for the very same thing. So we put out an alert with in defense of animals, lots of different organizations said, let's sign on. I think we had more than 1700 letters that got in in a very short time. And they actually pulled that item off the agenda. And that's a rare thing to see. And all of the time at Biona, I have never seen an agency uh, take an item like that off the agenda. Usually they know they've got the votes, they're gonna do this. But because so many people wrote in, they decided to take that off the agenda. So they're still looking for that money and we're keeping an eye out for where they might go next. But bottom line is they they your letters worked and we just need to keep raising our voices. Yeah, and that was that alert was done at the regional level. So it was sent out to this our supporters in the state of California. So we want to thank all of you who signed that. And that was somewhere around a thousand people who signed it, but it shows how how many people it takes to make a difference like that. It's actually a, that in the grand scheme of things, that's a, a small group of people that can actually change the agenda for the meeting. So that was, that was a, a, I guess we'll call it one victory among others. And then it looks like um, Robert, who's um, Roy van der Hoek, who's been very active in this campaign, is sharing that there's a shore bird known as a dowager um, who stops and rests at the Bayona wetlands in its southerly journey in summer and in early autumn from late, late spring nesting in the Arctic to the Amazon River Delta in Brazil, in South America. And then in spring, the Dowager stops again at the Bayona wetlands. So how important is this wetland, especially if you consider Los Angeles, which is a very metropolitan area and these places for the birds to actually stop and rest during their flight they're few and far between because they've been um, covered over. A lot of the rivers areas have been channelized, um, meaning there's concrete in there. So this is a very important habitat for the area. So there's another question. Could you explain the possibilities of the National Park Service with its focus on nature and culture, becoming the future manager and steward of the Bayona wetlands? Well, that's kind of our long-term vision. Um, we have a Congress member for this area, Ted Liu, 
And he, you know, did something very courageous himself. A number of us went to him and asked him if he would consider uh, sponsoring a bill that would direct the National Park Service to come out and study this area. And he did that. And President Biden signed the bill into, into law about a year and a half ago. And the National Park Service is ready to come out here. We're not sure how long, we think maybe in the next six months or so they might be here, but they're gonna be here for three years. And they're sending out some of their experts. They're sending out experts in nature, biology, culture, history, and all of the things that the National Park Service really excels in. And what's so great about them, different than every other natural resource agency, whether it's state of California, state of Illinois, the federal government, the National Park Service has what's called the National Park Service Organic Act that guides them. And they would never have a methane gas storage facility. I can tell you that they would, if they were to decide to be here and the governor might decide to uh, offload this, this problem he's got to them, which we would love to see happen. If that were to happen, the National Park Service would start work to move the fossil fuel industry off and would also, one of the things they do best is they really work with the community. And we have not seen that here with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. We haven't had one stakeholder meeting since 2004 or five, I think was the last time we had one. And so people, you know, they don't get to hear what's even there. They don't even know about the dowagers that one, this wetland scientist Roy Vandehoek just brought up. They don't know what they have here. We know because we have scientists who have been um, documenting things. We have naturalists who document animals and plants out there all the time. We have this amazing diversity of species and biodiversity as well. And Fish and Wildlife just doesn't understand what they have. Whereas the National Park Service, when they come to study this area, and they're gonna be studying, by the way, from, from Venice all the way to San Pedro and going up Iona Creek to the Baldwin Hills. And they're going to make a recommendation based on what they find and what they hear from the public. So it's gonna be very important for all of us to have our voices heard when they have their hearings they're gonna make a recommendation about whether or not they should have a presence here. And we think they should have a national recreation area here that it deserves having the presence of such an esteemed agency and, and would, would then be eligible to bring federal dollars into the area to help with the protection of the species. Thank you for, for sharing that. I um, guess we could call it a dream, but there is, it's got some basis in reality here because we do have, there will be physically here doing some studies. And yes, in defense of animals, we're 100% on board. We would love to submit letters when needed for that. Well, and we, we do have a national recreation area in the Santa Monica Mountains, and it was a dream of some people's. Um, you know, what would you say, Wendy Sue Rosen, I see is on here, who's on their community advisory board. Um, I think maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was a dream there. And now, um, you know, now it is a national recreation area with the Park Service presence. There's a national recreation area in San Francisco at the Golden Gate area. Um, and that's how they started the ferry service was through that um, implementing legislation. So there's a, there's a lot we can do. Um, and so dreams can come true if we all work together. Yes, yes, definitely. That area in the Santa Monica's is very, very popular people visiting. Um, I think there's a million visitors that go to it each, each year. This might be a little bit different because it's a, a different size area. Um, we also have another question. Could you explain further um, that the biodiversity during the last 25 years at the Biona wetlands um, with 
especially some of the species being recognized as uh, endangered. Any changes? Yeah, over what's the what's years? interesting is that as soon as the land became public, that meant that the developers, bulldozers, didn't get in anymore. And they used to, even though this part of the land had not been built on, they used to send their bulldozers at Playa Vista over to this side of the area. And we would have to go to the Coastal Commission and complain, what are they doing? They messed up these trees. They're trying to prevent the herons from nesting. I mean, we knew that they wanted to build on most of the land, but we we made it so that, um, you know, once it was acquired, they they couldn't do that anymore. So somehow, partly because of some of the recovery efforts from the U.S. federal agencies, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that looks after endangered species and tries to recover them, some of those species started expanding their range and coming back to returning to areas they used to be. And because the land here at Biona had started to, you know, basically heal on itself, which nature does that. Um, and some of this, some of the uh, landscape was already there. We've had three endangered species return that weren't here in 2003 when the land was acquired. So they've come back, started nesting, started um, having populations growing. And that's just the endangered species. There are also a number of other rare species that have come back. And then there's like a rare, there's an endangered bumblebee here that's on the state endangered species list. And that's, that was recently put on the state endangered species list. So we, you know, there just has, there wasn't a attention enough to even know what was here. But the bottom line is that in 20 years since the land was acquired, the landscape is coming together more and more and more animals and plants, butterflies, bumblebees, what have you, are, are working together here. And I think that that says something, uh, you know, there are some scientists who say you have to take 50 or 75 years to really see what happens in a restoration that you can't just do this, you know, come in and bulldoze for a few years and put up a, a ribbon and have a ribbon cutting and say that, oh, it's restored. That's not how nature works. So, um, you know, that's why we have this gentle restoration plan that we've put together that you know, genuine scientists who are not being paid to say a certain thing have helped um, develop. Well, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> um, I think this is really important in, in relation to the flooding of the wetlands. I'm wondering, that might be another thing to share, um, what, what this might look like once they um, take out the levees, what are we what are we thinking could happen to this this thriving ecosystem, which we can see has um, all kinds of animals. It has coyotes, it has uh, different animals. Well, first of all, this is a mosaic of different habitats. There are several different types of wetlands that are part of Biona. There are wet meadows, there are um, willow forests, there are salt marsh. There are a number of, there are about six or seven different types of wetlands. Some are more freshwater, some are more salty, some are in between, they call that brackish. And then there are some uh, habitats surrounding the wetlands that are very important because a lot of times the during big flood events, you've got to have a place for the species to go for refuge. And so there's coastal scrub, there's sand dune areas, there's grassland. So all of these habitats are there working together. And so if you take out the levees and you then basically invite the ocean inward, that not only is possible flood 
risk problems, but it also means we won't have the diversity of species here. These animals have evolved with a, a historical landscape here for at least 4,000 years. That means the ocean water was not coming in twice a day. It's not like the East Coast where you've got tidal waters coming in regularly. Um, we have actually more tidal water coming into Biona now than we have had historically with Marina del Rey, with the city lagoons and with Biona Creek. We've got enough salty areas. and But where the endangered and rare species rely on habitat, most of them are relying on a more freshwater or brackish water um, habitat. And it doesn't mean you just throw in a whole bunch of fresh water either. It means you've got to be very careful with the the balance that's there now. And why would you, if you've got all of these rare, beautiful species and why would you upend that and change it? I mean, what what is the purpose to change it? That's what we all keep saying is why do they wanna do this? Well, the only why we can figure out are the contractors who've already received millions of dollars to plan it, the contractors who want to receive some of the four to $500 million that would be a nine-year construction project, and SoCal Gas, who wants to expand their operation. So, um, you know, we have to be very careful with the balance there and and may, and you know, one of the other things that might happen, you might've heard that there was a big sewage spell. We just recently learned it started in West Hollywood and came down by Ona Creek. And that sewage that ended up in the ocean and has, you know, that's a big problem. We can't have sewage spills, but we do have them every once in a while. No, no, no. And if we didn't have the no, levees, there, that sewage would have gone into the rest of the ecological reserve. So that's not good either. And so there are lots of reasons to not have, to, to keep the levees there that are protecting the rest of the habitat and that are actually home for some of the uh, endangered species there. Thank you for explaining that. Because here at IDA, we're very concerned about the animals and we wanna make sure that their needs and their rights are considered. Um, so there's a couple of interesting questions here. One is, uh, do activists throw themselves in front of bulldozers anymore? <laughs> is that something that, that we would consider doing if, if it actually came to be that, that they were um, do, bringing the bulldozers out? Well, some of us who've been around a while are saying, let's, let's get this solved before it gets to that. But I can tell you that there are people that have said to me, we will not let this happen. We will do that. And in fact, 25 years ago, you know, between 1996 and 99, there were numerous activists who locked themselves to bulldozers when the Playa Vista development was in in its beginning permitting stages. And uh, that's part of what a part of an entire campaign that had lawsuits and other things happening uh, that ended up helping us to acquire the 640 acres. We really wanted to save all of that 1,000 acres and we didn't get it all. 400 acres are paved over and built on by Playa Vista, but 640 acres were saved. It's a lot, several hundred acres more than what they were going to think about giving up. And so, um, you know, sometimes uh, civil disobedience is in order. Definitely. Well, you can count us in when that when that comes to be. It it's uh, it's one way that one effective way that people have drawn attention to the issue. Uh, however, I think Playa Vista was built because I do drive by there. It's it's a. Uh, Sad to see, but it's near, very close to the edge of Bayona wetlands. Yeah. So there's another question here. Would you explain um, further that they're not only state land in the ecological reserve, but also adjoining public lands 
of the city of LA and county of LA and federal government and private lands that make up a greater wetland ecosystem. Yeah, um, we're talking about the Biana Wetlands Ecological Reserve, which is state land, but you know the birds don't know where the boundaries are. And there are a couple of lagoons that were part of the historical Biana Wetlands that are owned and or managed by different parts of the city. One, one lagoon is owned by or managed by the parks department. One is managed by the street services department. They consider it a street, uh, but the, the birds, like I said, they go back and forth in between. The county has uh, a couple of areas that are natural areas that they call wetlands or um, flood control basins. And then there's Biona Creek, which is partly owned, the water part and the land part are owned differently. Part of it's owned by the state of California, but part of it's owned by the federal government, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and they have a contract with the county to manage it. So it's a it's a very and yes, there are private lands too. There are um, there are some private uh, leases on the county marina lands where the great blue herons nest, for instance. They nest in these wonderful, big, huge trees. And the reason is there's food and there's nesting materials right across the water from them at the ecological reserve. So it's, um, it is a, a, it's not just a mosaic of ecosystems, but it's a, a, a mosaic of land management and ownership. And, you know, that's why it's easier to really say this is land that, the indigenous people took care of for many years and that they still see as sacred and want to protect. And so we're a little bit more aligned with them than we are with our government sometimes. Um, but it would be, you know, what's interesting is that we have at the top of the interior department, which the National Park Service is part of, we have an indigenous woman who is leading that uh, as the Secretary of Interior, Deva Holland. And then she also has under her the head of the National Park Service is a tribal indigenous uh, leader from Washington State. So, you know, maybe there's a way we can have some land back with the National Park Service and the Native people together guiding things in a better way for for the plants and the animals, which we all care about. And even locally, I recall going to one of the protests there in the area, and there were indigenous people joining and speaking out on behalf of the wetlands. Right, and we've had we've had a number of people come to speak at Zoom meetings with some of these agencies. So, yeah, it's just I just wish we had an agency that had, um, you know, really the plants and animals and the people more at the be at the forefront of their thinking and not the fossil fuel industry and the bulldozer operators. Well, that's what we're here for. We're here to advocate for the animals. And so we will continue and make sure that their voices are heard through us. Uh, I think maybe we're getting close to just our last question or so. Um, how about So to if you don't mind sharing a bit about how the gas company owes some of the wetland habitat with the Tidal Creek and also woodland habitat and sand dune slopes with grassland habitat, and it, it actually encompasses 100 acres, uh, and that oh. private land could be, could be increased. Right. Maybe add it to land. So SoCal Gas owns the mineral rights underneath the entire Biana Wetlands Ecological Reserve. So that's how they are able to use some of the some of the uh, pathways to bring their trucks in. They've got uh, rights of way across these pathways, and they're able to you know, come inject their gas and take it out. And then they've got a, 
a what they call a tank farm immediately adjacent to the ecological reserve. And that's probably what this person was talking about. There's about a hundred acres of land that SoCal Gas owns itself. But again, a lot of that was part of the plan for the quote restoration. And so even though they do have rights to store this gas right now, we like to see that changed. We'd like to see an amortization plan where they can be bought out by the city or the state, much as many of the oil fields are, are happening in the oil fields across California right now. Um, but they, so they have that right, but they still don't have the right to do all of this um, altering of the landscape around their property um, or even on the parts of the property that were part of the environmental impact report. So that's why it's so important. And I'm going to say this again, please be sure to sign that alert and be sure to send that alert around to your coworkers, your family, your friends, and make sure we get as many letters as possible into the governor and all of these, uh, and the oil and gas supervisor who could put a stop to it himself. And he does report to the governor as well. Thank you, Marcia. And thanks to everybody for signing that, that alert and sending your letters directly to these decision makers. I wanna also mention that uh, Catherine, uh, who's here with us, she put in the in the chat a wonderful little message seasonal rainy um season rivers for thousands of years have been in los angeles and that is our real local ecosystem so we don't need any kind of fake restoration to an environment that isn't at all natural here 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 great well, thank you, Marcia, for taking the time to share all of your vast knowledge on this topic with us today. This has been such a pleasure to partner with you and with the Defend Bayona Wetlands, which includes, gosh, how many organizations are part are in that? I think it's like- Oh, uh, we have at least 40 organizations, including about eight Democratic clubs, the LA County Democratic Party, Sierra Club, numerous organizations have taken a position against this project and for a more gentle restoration. And you can find that information at defendbionawetlands.org. Yes, thank you, Marcia. And we're we're um, working in partnership with with Defend Biona Wetlands. And um, I remember when we were deciding the name of the group and coming up with that and everything. So we've been really integral and in this, this um, group, this coalition since the beginning. And we will continue with this. We want to, this is, we've invested a lot of time and energy and effort and everyone here has uh, supported this through signing all of these alerts and your donations and the t-shirts. <laughs> and so we do wanna stick with this and we wanna see um, a victory here. And thank you so much to everybody for, for joining us, for caring about the wetlands and for, finding this uh, unique way to celebrate the American uh, Wetlands Appreciation Month. So some of you will be getting, I think at least maybe three of you will be getting a, a Biona Wetlands, Defend Biona Wetlands t-shirt, which is so cool. I, I have one actually, I'll, um, I was just thinking, oh, that's another, it's a, so great. It's it's a lovely blue and it, it, it has one of the, um, uh, the owls that are that are living. It has the burrowing owl, and it has a beautiful depiction of the Lewis Evening Primrose, which is a beautiful wildflower that we have at Biona. Thank you so much, Marcia. Um, we do appreciate you, and we appreciate everyone else for being here today. If you have any other questions, you're welcome to um, send in email to us, you can email uh, wildanimals at idausa.org, and we will go ahead and respond to you. And as Marcia mentioned, please sign that alert, and that'll be one action step that you can do to help at this, at this stage. But stay tuned for more. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, and thank you to In Defense of Animals. Great organization. Uh, thank you, Marcia. And Bob, anything else you want to say? Anything you want to 
Uh, Nip, just thank you for your time. Uh, if you haven't already done it, please sign the alert. We work very, very hard to make sure that it is actually goes to a person, not a black hole. So, uh, and and this is all evidence that it is working. So, um, this is we were just trying to help people have their voice heard. So, please sign the alert, sign and share. Awesome! <laughs> thank, thank you all you. so much. Enjoy the rest of your evening and we hope uh, we'll stay tuned for the replay. We'll send it out uh, shortly. And then we hope that you join us for our next fireside chat in June. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.